So the, uh, uh, and, and if you look, it's about a 10, what that straight line means is that uh, uh, when the first prototype was built versus uh, when the first commercial dollar, what you realize is the, even at that point, it's a delay of about 10 or 15 years for a fundamental innovation. These are all fundamental innovations. The top right one is mine, which is strain silicon, uh, which is a technology that's all in every uh, microprocessor and other chips now in your, in your laptop. So the, the, if you look, there's this constant, we can talk about later in question and answer if you're interested why there's that delay, but fundamental innovations, you can think about it very easily as if you're gonna disrupt something, and create a lot of value, implementation generally changes a lot, right? We introduce a lot of uncertainty in that. And what that means is that it takes time because you're not just gonna change an entire you know, industry overnight, right? You have to have thousands of organizations, thousands of people and many organizations on board and it takes time. They all have to figure out how they're gonna get value out of the thing. And that's why it takes time for these fundamental innovations. So I hope, you know, in, when you give a lecture like this, there's always two ways to go. Either you tell them how it really is first and then tell them how they're thinking now, or you start off telling them how they're thinking now and then tell them how it really is. Uh, I think with the model that we talked about, hopefully you can see, uh, and I'm gonna go through examples now of our own technology and, how the, and use this model, but everyone is organized not towards this model, right? Which means that all of our organizations today are inherently not aligned towards rapid innovation, which is exciting because it means you guys can change that, right? You can actually create organizations that are more innovative than any organization today. So it's an opportunity. Now, of course, there's a negative side, which is we're in some global innovation minimum right now, and uh, it's gonna turn around very soon, but uh, the, um, the thing I wanna make sure I get across to you is we're organized in the following way right now. We believe that we introduce uncertainty in technology and we work on technology and that uh, what we're really doing when we work on technology and we don't pull in influence from market applications and implementation is that we make ourselves sort of the customer, right? That's really what you do. So let's suppose I'm doing some research and you say, well, how do you know what the best direction to go in, right? Well, uh, you know, I think of me or I think of me and the scientific colleagues I see at, at a research conference or whatever. The truth is that's making us the customer, right? You know, that's making us the market application part. And that's really dangerous because scientists are the worst customers, right? They, they often don't look like anybody else, right? So the, the thing is we narrow this thing down into like one very specific technology piece. And then by the time we do that, you know, we have narrowed our, ch our chances in the sense that the ways I can get this to market now are limited because I've already refined the technology so much without any input that now when I go to try to do something with it, I find out there's only so many ways I could even get it out, right? Like certain maybe manufacturing or certain business models or whatever. I, I haven't put any uncertainty in, but I try to shove it through and I pick one anyway. And then that original application, which I thought of a long time ago, if you think about fundamental research, you know, uh, 15, 20 years ahead of time. And then I'm shocked when I try to jam it into that one specific market I was trying to get a long time ago, it doesn't make it, right? So, so think about this, right? While you're doing all this effort, remember that the rest of the world is operating too. So think about how market application changes from other people, other companies. And think about how technology is changing, other people doing other technology, right? And think about all the business models shifting in the industry while you're doing this for 10 or 15 years. If you don't keep track of those things, you don't let them influence you, then there's no way that your idea is gonna make it you know, to the marketplace, right? So clearly, hopefully I've convinced you that, that this is not the way to go. The reason you don't hear often is either people don't care about this process, um, or it makes, to be honest, it makes me look better if I ignore this process. So I'll tell you, I'm gonna tell you the linearized story of the first example and it's gonna make me sound like I'm a genius, right? So I was at 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 and T, and I was this MIT educated person. I was a genius, and I could predict the future. And so I did research, and uh, when it got to a certain point, I formed a startup company, and I was this entrepreneur. And then I forced it into the industry, and made Intel license it, and eventually TSMC bought the the rest of the company, right? So 
uh, well, why wouldn't I tell the story? It makes me look very smart and uh, puts me on a high pedestal, right? The reason I'm interested in telling you a different story is that um, this is not how innovation happens, and that's the problem, is that we're all organized to this story. Now, this is historically accurate, by the way, but we all know when you record history, you remove process, right? You don't see the innovation process by recording outcomes. That's why we can't measure innovation by outcomes, because we end up with this story, right? So uh, let me tell you the, uh, um, uh, in a second, let me tell you the real story. So one of the things about, you know, I think it's obvious at this point, um, the classic problem in the United States, because there are places like MIT that does it a different way, although we even have some people teaching this linearized version, but the, uh, uh, all the state universities in the United States for a while, like about 15 years ago, they said we should have all these startups like the Bay Area and MIT, and we need to create technology licensing offices, and we need to have entrepreneurship. And so they all said, yeah, we're gonna like do all this technology. So they would do research, refine the technology, bring it to the dash line, which is kind of bring it out the university. And then they would all of a sudden try to match it with a particular business model and industry and try to match it with uh, uh, the application they thought. And of course, there's no convergence for the reasons we've talked about, right? So. Now what about Bell Labs? If you look at Bell Labs and IBM, they were great at the beginning innovation, but they had a very difficult time. Like mine, the beginning of the story you'll see starts, well it starts in university, but it quickly goes to Bell Labs, and the big discovery is in Bell Labs, how come I couldn't commercialize it there? Well, the reason that is, is that, remember I explained how the, in those companies they had such a market presence over many products that it was great to start the innovation. So you could get great ideas, and you actually had them before anybody else. The problem is that inside those organizations, as you narrow them and they start looking promising, you have to go to the existing channels. You have to go to the existing markets, and you have to go to the existing business models of that company. You're not allowed to kind of go talk to random people in the universe, right? So that means your choices are limited in, in market, and invitation to what the company is doing at that moment in time, right? And so that means that I'm gonna to try to now prematurely converge on those two exact market implementation things. And of course, I can't get that to converge either. And so there's no innovation in the marketplace. I can't force it through things it doesn't belong in, right? So that was the problem there. And I remember when I was a, when I was a young man at like AT&T, I got to say, wow, Bell Labs gets out like five years before anything's really important they drop it, you know? And I was like, how can this be? And now I understand this is why, right? They, you gotta remember corporations back then didn't authorize engineers and scientists if they couldn't get it through the channels in the organization. They didn't tell them, go out and embrace partners and other folks, right? Things like that didn't happen back then. And they didn't realize that actually was limiting their research impact on innovation productivity, right? They didn't, they didn't realize that. All right, so let's go for the first example. So first example is uh, strain silicon, and uh, you know it's a fantastic thing. It's in, like I said, in all your laptops. And uh, uh, actually, something again you'll see. We didn't anticipate this. We didn't even know it when we were forming our company and going out there. What was happening simultaneously, which we didn't know about, was that Moore's law was ending. Those of you who are in electronics know Moore's law is a shrinking of. Uh, of transistors, the increase in density of transistors uh, in a power law over time, right? So this is a big deal. This is the late 90s, uh, this was the yeah, late, late 90s, uh, the leading edge, um, high performance CMOS people, Intel, AMD, all those guys, had built 90 nanometer transistors and they were clearly falling off Moore's law and there was no future, right? Now, of course, we started working with all these people. They never told us how dire the situation was because they needed our stuff. They didn't want to you know, encourage us too much to ask for more, right? But uh, I'll, I'll, uh, the, the thing is, this, this is a huge impact, right? And we could have never known, really, the size of the impact when we started, okay? So it actually started in my PhD work at Cornell University. And one of the key things was the influence of those large corporate labs, which no longer exist in the United States, by the way, but when companies had those large corporate labs that, that did basic research that overlap with universities, there's a very positive 
a very positive thing that happened, and uh, um, that's how this whole thing started, is that uh, at that time, uh, you'll see my advisor was Dieter Ast, a German guy from Stuttgart, and uh, ver very German in the way he interacted. And he used to go to Palo Alto every uh, summer in order to uh, just, just hang out at HP Labs. He had a good relationship there, and he would learn about you know, what HP considered to be important. Now, he didn't necessarily come back and do exactly what the company said, but he would come back and he would kind of have an idea of what basic problems could be interesting. And that's how we started some of our work. And there was a second phase. Once we started in that direction, there was a guy named Jerry Woodall, who's a national technology medalist in the United States now. You know this, uh, MIT has, uh, uh, United States has these prestigious awards. They're like the US Nobel Prize kind of thing. And he's got one now. Uh, but anyway, he, um, he was an IBM fellow. I used to hang out at Cornell every once in a while. And he's the one who said, hey, Gene, you know, these lattice mismatch materials, they're going to be important in the future. And there was some overlap with what, what Dieter had seen at HP. And so we said, hey, let's start working on this fundamental problem. And the problem was that people at the time uh, didn't know anything about how these defects were coming into lattice mismatch materials, which are, you know, let's suppose I try to deposit gallium arsenide on silicon so that I could have um, optoelectronic materials uh, even back then, especially in AT&T, we knew you could see how optical links were coming shorter and shorter, and you could project it. In the future, they'd like to come into a single integrated circuit. But the problem was, how do you get materials that, that emit and detect light efficiently, how do you get them you know, into an integrated circuit? And so this is a fundamental problem, and it's, that's just one application. Remember I talked about, this is a fundamental thing that if you solve this problem, there's so many applications, right? It's a good problem to work on. And so that's why I stopped drawing the little circles inside, by the way. But so here, it's still very basic research, but now we're working on this general problem of lattice mismatch semiconductor. We have um, uh, integrated circuits are our target, right? It's not just all electronic products now. And then uh, we're assuming the HP and IBM type of, of corporate uh, implementation that you would use their factories or whatever to, to produce this stuff. So the problem of just getting a, a little bit of engineering and science is that uh, if you, back then, if you deposit gallium arsenide and silicon, you would typically see this in cross-section where you have all these defects coming up, running through the top film. Those black lines are dislocations. And the reason is that when you go to temperatures, deposit gallium arsenide, um, the, the temperature required to seed off the silicon to make the same crystal structure uh, is high enough temperature that semiconductors go from brittle stage to ductile stage. So what happens is um, they're actually plastic. So you're depositing this, this one material on another, and because of the lattice change, they're forced to sit on top of the silicon lattice, so you build up huge stress as you grow. And so what happens, of course, at a point what's called the critical thickness, you want to introduce dislocations which have energy, but they come in, they relieve energy, and you have this problem, right? So these dislocations act as recombination centers, which means that you try to make solar cells, try to make lasers, try to make anything uh, that's minority care lifetime, and even for majority care device, uh, it's, too, it's too short. So basically, it's, a, it's useless material, right? So very fundamental problem. The terminology is threading dislocation but, uh, and misfit dislocation. You have to have misfits at the dislocation to relieve stress, but the threads that come up through there are actually part of the same thing. Those of you that are into material science know a dislocation can't end in a crystal. So even though you need the part at the interface to relieve the stress, the threading segments always have to come up. So this really means there's a nucleation problem, right? That's what you realize when you, when you consider the theorem, theorem that dislocation can't end in a crystal, and you need those misfit components. What you realize right away is that the number of threads that I have is connected to the number of nucleation events of the dislocation, because every time I nucleate a dislocation, I have two threading arms I have to deal with, right? So that allows you to start engineering, and I'm, I'm abbreviating 20 years of work here, but uh, as you can see in this bottom right-hand corner, uh, today, and this has been, uh, this is actually now in, in multiple ways, I'm trying to commercialize various things off of this many years later, because it's so fundamental, is that now we can make gallium arsenide and silicon of really high quality. And we did it because we focused on silicon germanium, which is a miscible alloy, and we could actually uh, learn 
and studied dislocation nucleation propagation using silicon germanium. So silicon germanium all of a sudden, remember how we talked about, it became the material focus now because that's the one that we can engineer as we both learn about dislocation nucleation propagation, but then also how to take that knowledge and build structures that are defect free almost, right? So if you look at the, on the left, these dark areas that you can't really see too well uh, from the back there, those are massive areas of plastic relaxation, right? So consider this the other one. I'm creating zones where we're deforming this thing massively, and then at the top, we have very few threading dislocations coming up, right? A real amazing feat in terms of controlling plastic relaxation and then creating a very highly mismatched, high perfection material at the top surface. Now, even, even though that, um, even though that was the holy grail, and like I said, we're there today and we're building things that we're gonna try to commercialize. Even though that's what's happening today, uh, you know, we had to show our management something at AT&T because what happened was, and you guys can relate to this if you're, if you're an SCG or whatever, we had a management change and we had to like say why this work is important, right? So we had to come up with something really fast, right? So what do we have? Well, the, the gallium arsenide was good quality back then, but it wasn't as good as I showed you here. Uh, but we could, we could go part way and we could make relaxed silicon germanium, like with 30% germanium, really high quality. And so we said, what can we do with that, right? And what you could do with that is, remember how I said we can induce lots of strain? Well, if you actually have a bigger lattice constant and now you deposit a thin layer on top of silicon, it tries to line up with the larger silicon germanium lattice. And so you can make a thin layer of silicon that has a gigapascal of stress, a strain in it, right? Uh, stress in it. And, and, and a gigapascal of stress is enough to make uh, the band structure of silicon change and you get really high mobility carriers, right? So the cool thing about this is think about it. If you, if you increase the carrier mobility that much and it's still silicon, now you start to bring in implementation. You say, well, if it's silicon, you know, I'm getting mobilities that are closer to gallium arsenide, but it can still be manufactured inside the same factory, right? Not only that, as the market is now silicon CMOS, which is enormous market, right? So uh, even at this physics experiment level, people knew that there was a lot of importance. And back then at Bell Labs, we demonstrated the first high mobility uh, electrons in, in four Kelvin, so a physics experiment, right? Uh, and we got on the cover of Bell Labs News. Now, Bell Labs News back then, by the way, that's like the internal Nobel Prize, right? So to be on the cover was like, wow, this is like totally fantastic, right? And just to show you though, this is a dangerous game. If you blow that up a little bit, notice that I had more hair at that time. So be wary, innovation, as uh, our colleague from Japan yesterday pointed out, is a very painful process. <laughs> so just to show you how it's narrowing now, remember I said that the key material for all this was silicon germanium. So remember we were working on other things. So this whole thing now is a very specific material system, silicon germanium. Then, now we're talking about AT&T circuits, and then we're still assuming corporate implementation. We're gonna use this AT&T factories, and we're gonna use the AT&T business model. And that's the problem. It, as exciting as this was, we actually brought this to room temperature, we showed it had high mobility, we started making devices, but it was very clear there is no way in hell we're gonna get the manufacturing facility um, in, in um, Allentown to do this, right? No way. So, you know, it's either I stay with the current organization uh, and let this dream die or I move, right? So uh, lesson here for SCG is you gotta figure out how to take these innovators and let them do their thing, otherwise you'll lose them. Uh, so um, I actually went to uh, MIT and worked with young people that looked much further out and very excited about trying to build that future. And uh, uh, again, at this point in time, what happens is we now have, so after you do this first physics experiment, what happens is it's never ready, and this is the problem a lot today, is that you, you, you kind of get a lot of excitement and there's lots of press articles written today and everybody gets excited, right? The problem is that big advance is never the final advance. Just because you prove it can happen, to commercialize it, there's a lot of other research problems that come up that aren't the same magnitude, but they're still important. 
And so we worked on those at, at, at MIT. We worked on surface planarity. Uh, you can see here threading dislocation and uh, stability. And uh, now it's becoming clear what they could be used for. So there's very three applications, optoelectronics, wireless, and digital, right? Very, it's starting to become very, very clear now, although still pretty broad. And then now that you're at MIT, and this is an important part of university, is now, now that I'm at MIT, I'm not limited by the business models of AT&T, and I'm not limited to the market applications of AT&T, right? I can go talk to uh, any telecom company I want, I can talk to any semiconductor company I want, I can talk to whatever. So now I have the uncertainty I need in those areas to try to bring this together, right? So we form a company to do that because now we, we couldn't, we, we get interest. So now by going out there talking to all these companies, we get interest, but of course, you know, the usual thing they want it for free and they don't want to give us any money and you know, whatever, right? So uh, we form a company and get some financing to kind of bring it over that threshold and th that company was Amberwave. And when we started, we actually didn't know if we could get the outside vendors that we we're gonna partner with. We didn't know if we could actually do the technology good enough. Meaning that we had to have one Angstrom RMS, you know, very challenging metrics in a completely new material system. And we were doing crazy things like CMPing epitaxial layers, which back then nobody did. We had great intellectual property on that. And we were able to produce with our partners things that met the spec for integrated circuits, which was a, a thin, super strain layer, absolutely planar across an entire a large silicon wafer. And this is the early company. There's uh, a few people involved there. Our first CEO is the person on the far right. Uh, that's actually my dad who was retired, and he did everything like got health care for people and all that sort of stuff. He was great, he was just happy because you know, he was you know, helping us. That was one of my first grad students to his left, which is Mank Bolsara. Um, and then uh, Ken, Ken was an uh, uh, operations guy that we got from Tropicana. You guys know the, the juice company, so we recruited him from there because he knew a lot, a lot about um, uh, uh, fab operation. So now it's looking interesting. We're partnering with almost everybody, Samsung, you know, the, the entire planet, uh, anybody who's looking at leading edge at technology is partnered with our, our little company. And we're making revenue on engineering services, materials. You know, the sun is shining, it's bright, and everybody starts coming out and saying that they're interested and they're gonna probably do this technology. The problem uh, came in is that the big dog, Intel, is being very quiet and not saying anything. And we didn't partner with them. We partnered with everybody else. And the reason for that, by the way, one of the negative things is if you take investors, they like to make the big guy pay last because, of course, they can extract the most capital. But that creates huge tension because it means that you know, you're gonna have a big fight at the end, right? And uh, Intel comes out and uh, making a, a, a long story short, the Intel tries to do something else and they uh, use our technology, but they tell us they're not using our technology. And to make, uh, they basically um, try to incorporate all of our technology inside a CMOS fab, so nothing has to happen outside. Now, nobody did this before. It's one of those typical things that, you know how people tell you they'll never change a manufacturing process. The truth is, they'll never change a manufacturing process until it's really important, right? That's what that means. So Intel goes through this enormous change just to, you know, basically uh, not uh, have to show anybody outside what they're doing. And so that actually changed the business model for everyone, and it was very clear what we had to do is um, our implementation was gonna change. So we were kind of going down that path, and it was clear we had to do two things now. So now it's getting really resolved. Either we're gonna have to build our own products, I would never build microprocessor too complex, but we could build our own products in some other area, or we're gonna have to build, or we're gonna have to license Intel, which is also really difficult because Intel doesn't license anything from anybody. They like to destroy you instead. Right, so uh, the, the, we ended up uh, um, having an argument at the board level. This is very common for big changes like this. And eventually, uh, the company did correct itself, Amberwave did correct itself, go on a licensing path. And after a, a patent battle, they ended up licensing Intel for, Intel took control, one of the agreements was they took control of the press release. 
So um, the press release does not have the number that they licensed it for in it, but it was for a small company, a very substantial amount. And then TSMC came in to have parity and bought the company for the rest of the intellectual property, basically. Um, because I'm short on time, we can come back to this in the question and answer. I'm not gonna have time to talk about the water example. We can do that later if you guys want. But let me jump to the end of the presentation. So uh, I wanted to end with just two slides on university and then, and then a final motivation slide for all the uh, engineers and scientists in the audience. So, um, you know, let's put everything I just said together and let's think about the university. Remember I told you, I can see that the two missions in U United States universities are going to change over the next 10 years very rapidly because of um, online learning essentially uh, and what that means for the residential campus, which a place like MIT, it's all gonna be about experiential learning on innovation, right? So uh, if you think about most education today, uh, the way it's taught in the United States, uh, we're still educating with the idea th of, of specialized roles. And you know, it, this, this changes depending on where you are in the world, but looking forward, right, I could tell you that today compared to 30 years ago, no one hires an MIT student to actually do their discipline and only their discipline in general. They're too expensive for that, to be honest, right? So what they really hire them for is, yes, I want you to use your specific knowledge, but I want you to solve my problem, this problem today. And by the way, I want you to solve another problem a little bit later and another problem. And that actually some of those problems might not have anything to do with your specific discipline, but they have a lot to do with innovation, right? So what, what I'm trying to do at MIT is to get us to focus more and more on, 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 on absolutely rigor, absolutely still technology detail, but do it in a context of innovation as opposed to you know, the kind of structures we currently have where, you know, for example, at MIT, people are assuming that you know, mechanical engineers, we still teach them as if they go off to you know, GM and, and like work for car companies, which like nobody does, right? So, you know, we haven't really, um, even though unofficially, if you look at MIT, there's all sorts of organizations doing all sorts of entrepreneurship and everything else. So what we're doing is we're using the non-academic structures to basically do the real education, which makes no sense. Like, why don't we change so that we can, you know, be more effective? Um, and, and I think that, you know, one model is that uh, in the U.S. universities, there's been a huge injection of entrepreneurship, and that's been okay. Like I said, I think there's some problems with the way that we've injected that. But much that way, I think we have to inject now innovation, right? So it's not all about company formation, right? If it was all about just creating small and medium-sized companies, then that's easy, right? That's what people have done. Like I was saying, these experiments in the US, every state university, they just create lots of companies, but of course they're not innovative, so nothing happens, right? So we need to take it now to the next step and we need to start teaching students specifically about the innovation process. Uh, and I think that's you know, always delayed because uh, even in a place like MIT, most professors are not innovators, right? So this transition is gonna take some time, but I think, um, I'm hoping that MIT can lead in this and that we'll be able to um, you know, go into that online world with a residential campus that um, really is unique and, and just launches us again, far, far into the lead in terms of universities. Uh, you know, university research, uh, one of the issues, except for online education, by the way, is that generally the university doesn't have a, a lot of information about market application and implementation. Remember I was talking about Bell Labs, one of the beautiful things was that all those applications were in-house and we could talk to the person right down the hall, right? So to find the right problem is more difficult at a university because, uh, especially if, if you don't get out there, and you're not interacting in a deep way uh, and thinking long-term enough, then you know, it's really hard to identify the right research project. I mean, that's really key. It's what you work on that automatically determines your probability of success more than anything else, right? I always tell this to students, everybody at MIT is smart. So they come in having to get there, they have to like be the smart person. But then when they get there, I said, Don't, you know, everybody's smart enough. So it has nothing to do with that anymore. So, there's still, you see different students do different things. Some are still trying to be smarter than the next student. It doesn't matter, it has nothing to do with that, right? So now it's about, you know, can you translate, you know, your potential into impacting something, 
right? And so I think that without that knowledge, you know, it's very difficult. So more and more overlap, if we can have overlap with corporations, but you know, you can't do short-term work at corporation either. That's not very good because that's just, um, you know, something all MIT professors do is 